Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, <laughs> this works. Ah, this is for recording. All right. Hello. So, this works. This works. Can you hear me? Yes. So, what is the name of this podcast? Ah, yeah, Longer Tables. Welcome to Longer Tables. And Jane said this is my first live podcast, and this is the last live podcast. <laughs> I can't believe how many people are here to watch a podcast. This is a little surreal. Uh, I think they have food and drinks after. Well, I was going to say, they must uh, promise food and drink. I see you have some wine there. You're very smart. Yes. OK, there you go. So I guess I have to say I am Jose Andres. And welcome to Longer Tables. So I don't know what they promise Anderson to be here with me. <laughs> but it had to be something very big, like a big paella pan or something. <laughs> it was just the honor of being in your company. To be oh, honest. yes. <laughs> it's true. Or the pleasure, I should say. So at longer tables, Anderson, we... By the way, this is the first time I've seen you, and you haven't been like, I don't know, like running in, in front of a, a huge pot of paella in like Puerto Rico or in Ukraine or... You're not like getting into an armored vehicle to go somewhere or, yeah. I feel like, where have you just come from and where are you heading off to tonight? Uh, so this podcast became Longer Tables by Anderson. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, got it. I want to learn from you, but I came from, I, I came from Washington, D.C. Okay. And you know what happens now when I go somewhere and I tell people, I tweet, I am here, whatever. Next question is, what happened? <laughs> I'm like, I'm yes. on vacation. Yeah. I'm playing golf. I, I've had that as well, where I'll get on a plane, and literally people's faces will drop because they're like, what is happening in the place we are flying to? <laughs> so I'm like the angel of death. Yeah. So you asked me where I came from. I came back from Augusta, beautiful Georgia. I was at the Masters. I was, I, I, I fed family and friends. I was able, you like golf? Who likes golf? I was able to feed Sergio Garcia, who you know, he won the Masters 2017. I know he won because he's a great player and I was feeding him. I was the caddy on the part threes with Sergio Garcia on Wednesday. I put the bottle, the, the ball on the water on hole number nine. But I hit a perfect shot in the water. <laughs> and and you news are that John Ram himself, the winner of the green jacket, before, before he won it, they asked him, what will happen if you win the Masters? And he said, I don't know what will happen, but I know one thing for certain that Chef Jose Andres will help me make the champion's dinner menu the year after. So that's where I came from. Nice. So now let's just talk about what I came from. By the from. way, when you were talking about sports, I went to the special place in my head where I just, I know nothing about sports and I can't even pretend to be interested. So I just go to a special place when straight people talk about sports around me. Okay, so, so you don't know what the sports, and ladies and gentlemen, this is probably the first guest that I have, that I consider him a friend. But I don't know if you know. Anderson, the talk on the street, is that he's not really a food person. That is correct, yeah. I, I am ambivalent at best about food, yeah. So, I mean, he's famous for it within his group of friends. It's true. So I drank Soylent for a year. You know what Soylent is? Yeah. Do you know Soylent? You know what Soylent? <laughs> Soylent is what people describe as the end of humanity. <laughs> and by people, he means Jose. <laughs> when we will be used, I don't know, like in bed, not moving because the planet will be, I don't know, and we will be with a tube of Soylent <laughs> through our noses, ears, veins, and mouth. It sounds like a dream to me. <laughs> if only it was that. <laughs> so, uh, 
the truth is that one of the first times I spent a lot of time with him, I was very lucky he was doing a, a profile on me, uh, for, about me and my team on 60 Minutes. And I can testify that I, I gave him a liquid olive, which is something that sounds very strange, but it's delicious. But it took a lot of convincing from their producers to make him eat it. I never, I never actually had an olive before. Yeah. So he ate my, the, his first olive with Jose Andres. Yeah. Yeah. And I can testify that maybe his first gin and tonic also was with me because he was very really tipsy. Yes, that is true. I, and I didn't know that this was vodka either, but... Uh, uh, and this, I think, was the beginning of the world-famous New Year's Eve special <laughs> on CNN, <laughs> yes. where, you know, you understand why they, they didn't allow more alcohol. <laughs> but let's, let's go deep. Why? Because I think it's in important for yeah. me to now, now moving into serious. What was your childhood like? Uh, uh, what, uh, what kind of food was happening? Why, why you became this kind of fussy so in my eater? house, uh, So in my house, we didn't, I mean, this is gonna sound insane. There wasn't actually food in the house. We had, as I recall it, there was Carr's water biscuits in case somebody dropped by and had pate. And there was aquavit in the freezer. And that was it. And my mom would constantly say to me, like, you're so thin. And I would say, because there's actually no food in our house. And when there was food, it would be like, like, I remember, she, she, my mom didn't cook. Uh, you might be surprised to learn. Um, my mom was this wonderful person, but cooking was not top of her list. But she, she did claim to make a great spaghetti sauce. In fact, it was her housekeeper, Nora, who had been with her for 60 years, who made the spaghetti sauce and froze it, and my mom defrosted it. So that was my mom making the spaghetti sauce. Um, but yeah, there was just, I, I just, I didn't grow up, like, I grew up liking, I would eat one thing for weeks at a time. I was a very picky eater, so when I was in high, like, middle school, I would, for break, I didn't like breakfast food, so I would eat, like, a week of coffee ice cream for breakfast. And then I would switch to a baked potato. And then I would switch to my mom's mean spaghetti sauce for breakfast. And then whatever sort of fancy came across my mind. And that was allowed in my house. And yeah, and my mom wondered why I was so thin. <laughs> and I just never, and then in college, I was on a crew team. I was on a coxswain on a lightweight crew team. And I used to have to drop. 20 to 25 pounds before races. I was 145, but I have to get down to 125 or, or 120 if I could really push it. So I just stopped. I did not eat in college a lot during the season. And ever since, my relationship to food has been ambivalent. Like, I, if seriously, if I could drink a liquid all the time, I would be more than happy to. I mean, I love eating your food. I come here, I've, I've eat, I eat, and <laughs> I've been to your house, and it's been amazing. And like, you make things, I'm like, you're just. But I don't know how to cook. I don't know how to, and now I love olive oil. I will say, I, I, I do love olive oil. Um, yeah, and I'm trying to eat better, but I just don't, I don't know how to cook, and I, it just doesn't interest me enough. So what was going on on Thanksgiving? We would go to somebody's house who had food. We would have, we, and I remember, I remember going to friends' houses uh, it, you know, who I grew up with, and I just thought it was always so exotic to me because I would go to their house, and I remember I went, in college, I went to this kid's house, um, Mike Cavanaugh, um, who, and he, I went to his mom's house in Long Island, and he had, his mom on their kitchen counter had like a clear, round, plastic thing that had donuts in it. And I thought this was the most exotic, amazing thing, and you could just pick one up and take it and eat it. And I, I, for the uh, first 15... Hold on, you said that the donuts was exotic? Yes, <laughs> that it was just there and available. And she knew everything about Mike's life and all of who his friends were. And I loved it for the first like 15 minutes. I was like, this is incredible. I love this. And after about 30 minutes, I was like, this is smothering. I have to get out of here. I need, <laughs> I need no food. I need, I like, yeah. So it was, yeah, it's a little, I had an odd upbringing. Can so to me, to me, it's fascinating because we all love Anderson Cooper, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. And, 
and when you see that this is a guy very much knows about everything and anything. Yes. Sophisticated in more ways than we even imagine. Yeah. Smart, intellectual, but you can't actually understand him. <laughs> <laughs> this and but, sports are my great failings. This is true. But when I see a guy like him so sophisticated in so many ways, I will say that he will be one of the most sophisticated foodies. That's why for yeah. me it was so interesting, like if I am an anthropologist, to invite a human species like him <laughs> to my podcast because I'm trying to understand where we come from, where we are, and where we are going. Right. Well, the, uh, the idea, I mean, you know, I used to watch, uh, you know, I've watched your shows, I used to watch Anthony Bourdain, and I found it fascinating that you could understand a culture through food. And I remember when I first met you and, and we first shot a piece on Six Minutes and we did another one uh, in your incredible work in Puerto Rico. And that, I mean, I really realized I am missing out on this entire, it's like I live in a gray world and I'm missing out on this entire world of color and flavor. Uh, but maybe that's okay with me. Like, uh, you know, I, I got a lot of other things going on and I feel like this is, I feel like it's too late for me. It's too late to get involved. It's just too. It, okay, who, who will invite to their home <laughs> Anderson Cooper for any day? Thank you. Okay, all of New York, all of America, you have an open invitation. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, can you tell us about... But like Thanksgiving meal, you asked, I love Thanksgiving meal, so we would go to French vacation, uh, for Thanksgiving we would go to people's houses, and then for a year, I ate at Boston Market, uh, <laughs> because they had a Thanksgiving meal every day. And so, I ate there every day, to the point where Boston Market, which I think maybe has gone out of business, I'm not sure they're even still in business. Are they? But not in New York. Like, I think they're all there. They had one on 23rd Street and there was one on 58th Street, right? And anyway, they sent me like a specially made card that allowed me free Boston Market meals because they knew I went there literally every day. I never used it because I'm not allowed to accept gifts, so I, I just I didn't take them up on it. But I appreciated the gesture. Yeah, Chipotle, Chipotle gave one to me. See, Chipotle. I, yeah. I am allowed to take gifts. <laughs> I mean, the only moment that my daughters told me how cool I was was when they saw in my wallet I had a Chipotle, it, eat all you want for a year. <laughs> so yeah, food has this amazing power yeah. to make you cool. So. I, w I want you to tell us a story I think you told me in Lviv, mm. in Ukraine, or well, this is where I, I recall. Mm. Uh, uh, always, always is going where the news are, very often the dangerous news. But I remember we were at the bar, uh, you were working on a stop, but you told me the one dish that is your to-go dish every time oh, yeah. you go around the world. Yeah. And that's a pasta. Yes. Pasta. Spaghetti bolognese. A spaghetti bolognese. Yeah. Which, by the way, and, yeah, and I used to tell Anthony Bourdain this, and he used to mock me, because he was like, that's the one thing no chef gives a crap about. Like, that's, <laughs> that spaghetti bolognese has been on the stove in that hotel for a week. No one, like, no chef cares about some schmo who's going to be ordering the spaghetti bolognese at 2 a.m. But I find it comforting. Like, I like comforting things, in, especially in an environment like that. I, I want to know what something's going to taste like. I don't want to get sick. That's the main thing when I'm traveling. I don't want to get sick. I don't want to get food poisoning. I don't want to, whatever. And, I, and after what Anthony Bourdain told you, that he's been sitting there in the kitchen table, yeah. and still that's what you kept in. Yeah, how, I, I, how many pasta bolognese you had in how many cities around the world? Every, every city around the world I've had it. I mean, it really is my goal. If they don't have that, I'll have the penne pasta. It tastes sort of the same to me. So, I, so you are more a spaghetti guy, but if you have to, you to go To be honest, I've pen. actually now, uh, I actually have gotten serious about trying to eat uh, healthier and stuff, so I'm actually not eating a lot of pasta these days. So I'm eating a lot of like salmon, broiled salmon, cooked salmon, salmon in every sort of way. I've rediscovered smoked salmon, which I think is like the greatest thing on the planet, uh, and olive oil on smoked salmon and like wheat toast. I, there's nothing better. So that's literally what I had for lunch today. I had, I had some smoked salmon and uh, actually, yeah, and wheat toast with smothered in olive oil. I was so excited. All right. <laughs> so let's move, I'm a moron. let's move away 
Let's just slowly move. a sad moron. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's just start moving away from food a bit and in, a little bit in more serious things. So I love that you are here in my podcast, but I want to ask you about your podcast, uh, All There Is. Uh, an amazing, uh, yeah, you can clap. I mean, actually somebody listens to him, not like my podcast and nobody. <laughs> That was a yo. <laughs> My podcast is doing very well. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, your show, uh, the many things about losing your mom and, and the, the process that you go through mm. grieving. And, and it's very amazing when we see individuals like you uh, opening themselves in the way you are opening yourselves. Mm. Because it makes many of us, in a way, understand that we are not the only ones going through different processes in the relationships with loved ones. I had a, you know, a hard time relation with my mom, mm. uh, a woman I own much in, 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 in who I am, a woman that showed me love for others and for cooking. What was her name? But uh, Marisa. Marisa. Uh, she was a nurse, and, but I always had a huge Difficult relationship, one of the reasons I always left home early and I was in the world trying to find a way to belong away from my home, in part was this love. Hmm. Difficult, I will not say hate, but difficult relationship uh, with my mom. But, but I want to know how did making this show and, and, and talking to other people shape the way you personally understand grief now. Yeah. Yeah, I, look, I think it's particularly hard when somebody, you know, you're, whether it's a parent or a friend who dies and you've, and it's, and it's a uncomfortable death. It, it is, it's, there's unresolved issues, there's, you know, there's a complicated relationship and that adds a whole other layer, I think, to, to grief. Um, for me, I, you know, grief was not something I ever really, I didn't talk about. My dad died when I was 10 years old. Um, it was an event that completely shaped my foundations and completely altered the trajectory of my life. Uh, my brother Carter uh, died uh, 11 years later by suicide he, um, in, in front of my mom, and he killed himself in front of my mom my, right before my senior year of college. And um, yeah, and then my mom died four years ago. And for me, I was. Uh, my, my whole life I feel, I sort of feel like I've been shaped and whittled by grief and loss. And um, what I realized after my mom died, which I didn't expect, was the kind of the, the loneliness of it. The, um, the sense of being the last person uh, from the little nuclear family that I grew up with left alive. And that, I was ready for my mom's death. She was 95. She'd lived an extraordinary life. There was, unlike with your mom, there was, you know, we had a complicated relationship, but I, I, I was often much more, I was often, you know, in a parental role, giving her advice, like dating advice, and totally inappropriately, I'd be like, mom, he's gay. Um, uh, you know, which when you're 11, it's, it's a little weird. Um, but <laughs> um, I think what, what you know, I, with my mom, luckily, I, when my mom turned 91, uh, I decided to have this intentional conversation with her because I didn't want there to be anything left unsaid between us. I didn't want there to be things I didn't know about her like there is with my dad. There's a lot I don't know about my dad's life and, and I would like to know. Um, and so we spent a year having a conversation over email and I, it's one of the great blessings of my life that we did that because it, you know, when she did die, there, there, you know, we had the most extraordinary two weeks together before she died. And I was by her side and we laughed and I discovered we had, the, I always wondered where I have this weird giggle from. And I discovered, like, I only discovered afterward because I was recording the conversations we were having in the last week of her life. And when I listened to it later, I realized we were laughing so much. And it was the first time I realized we have the exact same giggle. It sounds like a chicken being strangled, but like literally it's the exact same and I can't believe I never knew that. So I discovered things about her even in the last week of her life. What I didn't expect though is the sense of loneliness uh, that I would feel after it. I, I thought I was ready, but I didn't realize 
when you're the last person from the family you grew up with, the last person who, you know, there's no one alive who knew me as a child, who knew the little boy that I was. And I, in this podcast and talking to, I started going through my mom's stuff, which was also going through my dad's stuff and my brother's stuff because it had all been packed away and no one had ever gone through it. I found myself recording uh, I didn't plan on making a podcast. I'm not sure the world needs another podcast, but I just started recording stuff because I read this, I'm, I love Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, and in it he talks about narrating experiences, horrible, he was in Auschwitz, he talks about narrating horrible experiences he was going through in his head as a way of sort of distancing himself from the experience um, and being able to get through the experience. And I started just not realizing that's what I was doing, that's what I started doing recording, and I decided to ultimately make it a podcast because I realized how alone I felt in this process of going through my mom's stuff and realizing this is a process probably everybody in this room has gone through or will go through at some point in their life. And uh, you know, I realized it gave me great strength in doing the podcast to, to hear from, I mean, I've heard from literally probably 20,000 people with direct messages on Instagram, very personal, voice, I've received like a thousand voicemails and I'm still in the process of listening to them. Um, but that this is a road all of us have traveled down and, and that gave me great, a great feeling of, of, that helped me tremendously to not feel so alone in my grief, to know that this is a road all of us will go down at some point and it feels isolating and alone. It feels like we're the first one on this strange road and in this strange world of grief. But to know that you know, we have all gone through it and everybody will go through it and there's great strength, I think, in that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some wine. Hey. Cheers. 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 Life, life doesn't come with instructions. Yeah? Yeah, that's for sure. You know what I've been trying to do? You know, when you do, if you watch 60 Minutes, you see that they always make a question that they make the person that you are interviewing make you repeat. Yes. It's world famous. I, I've been unsuccessfully trying for him to repeat the question. Obviously, I'm not a pro. <laughs> no, what you got to do is you got to, you ask a question. So, yeah, so that's, we, we, I've stepped away from that because it's become such a canard that I, you don't do that anymore. But what I, what I do, what I, in an interview, what I think is the most effective is you ask a question, the person answers, and then you don't follow up right away. Um, you just sit there. And generally, if, like, I'm comfortable with silences and I can, I can go for a long silence, generally the other person will unconsciously realize you're not, stepping in immediately with another question that you're actually thinking about what they've just said and you're listening and you're kind of, you know, and it's usually I'm trying to formulate something. And then the, they will then step in and the thing that they step in with and say is often the most wonderful thing that they will say. So that's my, that's what I have found in interviews. Oftentimes just, I mean, as you, you know this, it's just listening. Just, you know, there's so many people in TV who They've got their questions and they're just ready to go on to the next thing. And you see this, you know, with people who aren't as experienced and stuff, and it's it's unsatisfying as a viewer to see that. And so I, it's nice to be able to just kind of be with somebody who's listening and we're, we're just having a conversation. It's nice. Yeah. Life doesn't come with instructions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jose, life does not come with instructions. <laughs> so, so again, uh, Thank you very much for, for, for sharing your feelings, who you are, trying to get and sharing the feelings with others. And, uh, I think this type of, of, of moments, as I said at the beginning, that really, you know, when, when we see successful people like you, so determined on TV that you are not afraid of anything, mm. um, sometimes we think of people like you like, like superhumans. And I think it's very, very important that all of us, we understand that we are only as good as the people we have around us. Not in the amazing moments where everything seems successful and everything going well, but then sharing with every other human mm. on the planet that also we, all of us, we're going, we have our weaknesses, that we're going through grief. Mm. And I do believe it's something like I miss sometimes. 
Yeah. It seems we are all created in this way that we need to be showing mm. how strong we are, how successful we are, how happy we are at all the time. That becomes stressful. Yeah. That seems you can never have or feel a failure, that everything has to be perfection. Mm. And I do believe we need to show more of the imperfections that our lives go through. It's also, for me, being able to talk to people who have experienced grief or loss and, and actually learn from them. I mean, I, I had the most extraordinary conversations and I, conversations I would never have had with people because I'm too you know, introverted and shy. I would never have called up Stephen Colbert. I mean, I don't know the, even know if I have his number, but I, I, I would never have like, reached out to him to talk about you know, grief, but because I had this you know, podcast, I could, and, and he was willing to do it. And he's the most profound, I mean, he is, his father uh, was killed when he was 10 years old in a plane crash along with his two younger brothers, uh, Peter and Paul. And, um, you know, and, and like with me, that event changed the course, the trajectory of, of his life. And I mean, he talks about it and talks about being grateful for you know, coming to a place where, where he becomes, can become grateful if he wants to be the most human you can be, and I'm not giving justice to the way he phrases it, um, but to actually became, become grateful for the grief, to become grateful for the, the loss that you have experienced because it makes you more human. It, 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 it enables you to have empathy, it enables you to change and become a better person and be there for the people around you and in your life. And, and that's, it was such a profound notion to me. It blew, like the first time he said it to me, it, it, you know, he quoted um, um, uh, J.R. Tolkien who wrote in a letter, you know, what of God's punishments are not gifts. And to me that, that idea was stunning and it sort of changed the way I thought about grief. And I talked to Laurie Anderson who's like, if you don't know who she is, she's this incredible artist and musician and she was married to Lou Reed, um, and she changed the way I thought about grief. And all these people, B.J. Miller, who's a, a palliative care doctor, you know, talked about being able to still have a relationship with somebody even after they've died. And that relationship changes over time. And as you, as you age, you see the person, you know, as I've now surpassed the age my father was when he died, I now see him differently. And when I, was, when I became the age he was when he died, I understand, now that I'm a father, I see my, my relationship to my father changes. And so that's, there's great power in that to feel like, uh, like my father's story and my mom's story and my brother's story, like it's not, it's not over. Those stories, I still have relationships with them even though they are gone. My when my mom passed away, she was in northern part of Spain, near where my younger brother lives, outside Bilbao. And, and I didn't see it coming. And I, I had a lot of open conversations with her I never had. Hmm. And one of the first, one of the most successful dishes I have in my restaurants is croquetas. Um, croquetas is what my mom always made for my brothers and I. Mm. At the end of the month, when there was no more money in the bank account, working family, it's not like we weren't hungry, but my mom would use every last piece of whatever was left. Mm. The last half egg that was dry and the last, the last piece of ham that was sitting there dry like hell. Like, and she will get whatever was left and she will make croquettes. Uh, I remember the day, the first thing I did as a way to go through, I would say, uh, my own grief mm. was eating the croquetas and think about the amazing moments, watching her make the croquetas mm. and making fun that she will add anything there that was left over and how she never made the same recipe twice. That's what kind of helped me go through it, cope with, with this unfinished business I had mm. uh, with my mom by me being away and and being away from her kind of on purpose because mm. I needed oxygen yeah, in my yeah. own life. But food is in a way what, what got me reconnected with her. Mm. Even was too late maybe to solve a lot of the issues I had personally with her. Mm. But I realized that at the end I was only going to concentrate in those amazing moments we had often in the kitchen, mm. just feeding my brothers and my father. That's great. And, 
where my mother was. Without being a woman that liked to cook, I never saw her happier than in the kitchen, uh -huh. cooking for my brothers and my father and I. And this was a way for me to cope with grief. It's so interesting to me, the, the cycles that we all repeat that, um, you know, we think we are, you know, we all think we're the first to do stuff. We all think we're the first to go through some experience. And we all think we're the first to have this, you know, feeling of loss or, or whatever it is, or to have some work obstacle. And to me, the, the realization that, you know, we're all living in the apartments of dead people. We're all living in the homes of people. Uh, there are people who lived in the rooms that you live in People you don't know, you don't know anything about their lives, they were in your rooms before. And there have been generations of people, probably depending how new your building is, but you know, there have been generations of people who have lived in your apartment. And, and they went through the exact same stuff that you probably are going through, different permutations of it, different times, maybe they're wearing fedoras back in the 20s or whatever. But I, and I see that in, you know, I, I look at now my mom in a different way. And I, you know, I just, I read something just last night that my mom had said about me and I'd forgotten that she said it. And I realized how similar she and I were. And I, I, when she was alive, I looked at her as this like fantastic space alien whose like rocket ship had crash landed here. And my job was to like help her find an apartment to live in and give her advice. Um, but now I realize how similar we were in so many ways, which at the time when she was alive, I was so focused on sort of dealing with her, I didn't really recognize like how much we were the same person in so many ways. So I think it's interesting the cycles that, you know, that that's the dish that, that's, that, you're, that you remember most from your mom, even subconsciously you didn't realize that. Well. Thank you for sharing these stories with us, but I want to make sure you know that if the alien spaceship crash on Earth, uh -huh. it's because there's other spaceships out there, and they are the ones that put Soylent into Earth, <laughs> so they can overfeed us, uh -huh. and then when we are all overfed, uh -huh. one day they will start recollecting uh -huh. some of us one by one, so they can feed their people in the planets they uh -huh. come from. I, I do remember my mom, the other dish I remember having uh, for dinner, we would eat dinner on tray after my dad died. We, we, we uh, think a lot of things changed and we started eating, we started watching the news and eating dinner on trays, watching the news. That's how, that's what we did. Um, and, but I just, Nora would like leave stuff in the freezer, my mom would defrost it. And there were, we would want like one, and it was always the same pretty much every night, like one would be spaghetti. Well, the other dish that I recall was moisettes. I don't even know if I'm saying it right. What? Moisettes of lamb. Oh yeah. And so, and I, all I remember is I liked the, the 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 mint sauce that came with it. I didn't really care for the moisettes of lamb. But my mom was like, there were little two teeny tiny moisettes, whatever they are, two little specks of lamb. And my mom would be like, ooh, aren't these delicious? <laughs> and I'd be done with them in like 30 seconds. And, uh, <laughs> She, uh, and she was like, oh, did you have enough? I was like, no, of course I didn't have enough. Like, these are two little the, things. The mint sauce that looks like this yellow with <laughs> an, it, an identified green color that we don't know where it came no, from. No, 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 we had like mint jelly out of Like a, a jelly, yeah, 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 yeah out yeah, of the, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, so can we say that we will be expecting Anderson, Cooper, CNN, dinner at home, trays that you will buy in the supermarket? <laughs> no. Anytime soon? No. Yeah, Okay. No. I mean, I'll buy it. So let's move uh, on happier things because that, we don't I have- I will just quickly say, that's been, that was one of the concerns I had about having children. It's like, oh my God, how do I feed them? Like, okay, because that what, was going to be my question. What, how do, what, what do I do? Like they're, they're constantly needing food. They're constantly needing snacks and the things in between food. Yeah. Are, are they applying to be, I don't know, to move to another home that has better <laughs> yeah. cooking? Yes, I've sent them <laughs> to other people's homes for every meal. Uh, no, like, uh, so I, uh, yeah, no, it's an issue. So I, um, scrambled eggs I can do now and, um, they eat like a lot of oatmeal in the morning and still they're still drinking milk so that's like a relief and um, <laughs> but I, I'm worried when the milk stops that's going to be like a big load to, to fill in. So how it was like what was the feeling of becoming a dad at age 53? Yes uh, yeah I mean, 
Well, I didn't think about the age. Uh, the reason I waited so long, and it makes no sense whatsoever, but in my magical thinking was my dad died at 50, and I didn't want to have kids. I, I wasn't ready to have kids until I was like about 40. I wanted to be stable in all realms, and I thought 40 was about right. And then when I was 40, I realized, well, I, I'm gonna, I assumed I was going to die at 50 because my dad died at 50, which is a common thing people have who have lost a parent early. Um, and I realized I don't want to die on them at 50 like my dad did when they were 10 years old. So I didn't have, I was like, I'm not going to have kids. And then I hit 51. And literally the day I hit 51, I went to the doctor. And I told him, like, you know, I didn't have kids because I, I thought I was going to die this past year. And he looked at me like, you are just insane. <laughs> and he was like, you know, you're, I think you'll live to, you know, you could probably make it to the mid-70s. You know, I, I'd say that's a safe bet. I was like, oh, okay. So then I was like, okay, I'll have kids. So that's, I mean, it makes no sense that I waited, but, um, but it's, the great, it's, it's the greatest, I mean, it's, I can't believe I waited so long. I wish I'd done it earlier. Um, they are the greatest joys. Wyatt is, turns three April 27th, and uh, Sebastian turned one on February 7th. He just started walking. Um, and yeah, it's the most magical, extraordinary experience. And, and it's, um, yeah, I mean, all the cliches are true, and it puts everything in perspective, but it's, uh, it's truly the greatest joy I could possibly imagine. And it makes me feel they look so much like my mom and my brother, and they have my dad's eyes, and it's just, it's incredible. It's really incredible. And do they know that they have an uncle that knows how to cook very well? <laughs> I have, I've started dropping hints that they have, a, a, yes, an uncle who could help them out. If, well, when I was a kid, I'll tell you, when I was a kid, I, uh, my dad died and I dreamt for a long time of, I wanted to have, I, I felt my mom was amazing, but she wasn't the most sort of practical person as you might imagine. Um, and I was sort of the practical one. And I, real, I had a dream of having a board of directors. I learned, I'd read that, that companies have boards of directors. This, I was 11. And I was like, I would like to have a board of directors that maybe every, two weeks or once a month, I would go to their office and I would consult with, like, how do you pay taxes? How do I get a, like, a job? And all this stuff. And I wanted somebody who was like, good at real estate and good at like, finding a job. And so, uh, yeah, so, I'm, I, I'm, so now with my kids, I, like, I have, I'm creating like, a circle of friends, and I, you are part of it, who I want to have in their lives uh, so that they always know that if something does happen to me, they always know uh, that there, you know, that there is the support out there, and there are people who love me. Yeah. It's a nice concept to think like every one of us. We have to have a board of directors, <laughs> friends, and family that when we don't know all the answers because we don't have all the answers to life, we, we can go to them and get their feedback. I think this is a I would very love important yeah. concept. So here you have a new podcast <laughs> on the making. Oh yeah, that, the board of directors, yeah. that's what it's called? Okay. Be, because you're not busy. Yeah, You're, no, you're not busy, sure, you have a, use a new TV show, the whole story, you maybe just put in, launching this weekend, if I'm right. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's an hour long documentary series on, um, on CNN, it's on Sunday nights at eight o'clock, and it's, it's sort of the best of CNN correspondents and anchors around the globe finding stories they're really passionate about and giving them an hour to, so we just had Nick Payton Walsh who spent uh, about a week or so with a, a camera team uh, crossing the Darien Gap, which is a 66 mile stretch of jungle between Colombia and Panama that uh, migrants who are coming from South America, it's the only land route from South America to Central America. So if you're coming north, you have to make it through the Darien Gap and it's this, extraordinarily dangerous and difficult 66 mile stretch of road that thousands, tens of thousands of people are with families and children are marching on. And so Nick took this journey along the road. So that's, that was the, that's the first episode. How often do you pick the theme on 60 Minutes or on this new show? Or when do you call the producers and says, I specifically am very interested on this issue? Yeah, you know, I think a, a lot. I mean, I think, for, especially with 60 Minutes, I mean, to, to be able, I, I started working with 60 Minutes, I think maybe in 2006 or 2007, I started with 62, and, uh, you know, I grew up watching 60 Minutes. It is, without a doubt, the best magazine show in television. It's got the most extraordinary history, um, and it, it remains as relevant as it has ever been. 
Um, and it is, uh, I mean, I cannot believe every day that I'm able to, to work there. I do 10 stories a year for 60 minutes. And I, a lot of, you know, some of them are, I have a great team of producers I'm able to work with, or uh, the executive producer Bill Owens has ideas, or the producers do, or there are things, people I come across, uh, you know, I, I came across something that Rick Rubin had written a while ago, and suggested we do a Rick Rubin. Rick Rubin is this just extraordinary uh, record producer, just about every major artist. Uh, he sort of helped Johnny Cash like find his love of music again and created some of the best Johnny Cash albums. Um, but he's worked with everybody. And uh, so that was one I did recently that, that I just loved. I was just in Cambodia doing a shoot. And um, it's extraordinary that I you know, can pick from any story and be able to go and do it for 60 minutes. The most incredible thing in my life. So this is gonna be the last question, but what I wanted to know from him, the most fascinating story I've ever seen Anderson doing, where he was the food himself. I don't know if you remember, but these men went to the most difficult, dangerous place on earth in South Africa, and he went with a shark whisperer and out of a cage, in the open, he, he is scuba dive with white sharks. Yeah. Anderson Cooper, the guy that didn't like food, <laughs> was about to become the fish food of the sharks. How was that experience of all of a sudden becoming <laughs> The plate of food. Yeah, it was it was intense. I mean, so it was, yeah, it's a guy named Mike Rutson who uh, dives uh, for scuba dives with great white sharks, and um, there used to be a huge amount of great white sharks that came around Cape Town to Seal Island to hunt for seals, and all these boats would go out and they would put blood in the water, and the seals would come around, and tourists would come in the boats and see all the sharks, and this guy started scuba diving just on his own with them. And I went out with him a couple times on a couple dives. And it, I mean, it's, it goes against every fiber of your being, you know, having grown up watching Jaws, to see, you know, not only them spending an hour putting blood in the ocean and seeing, you know, six enormous great white sharks circling a boat, to then be like, okay, we're going in now, and to actually just jump in the water. But it's, uh, it was an incredible, incredible experience. Um, and yeah, I did a number of dives. And later, actually, for 60, uh, 60 then realized I'm the only person who scuba dives on 60. So any water-related story, they're like, oh yeah, he's an idiot, he'll do it. So there was these filmmakers in Botswana who came up with this idea that in the Okavanga Delta that there was a two-week window when the water was, was cool enough uh, that the Nile crocodiles, sharks, great whites only kill like six people a year and they don't really mean to. They're, it's, they're curious and they bite people and then you bleed out. Um, so it's not intentional. Nile crocodiles do actually actually kill you and eat you, uh, and they kill about 200 or so people a year. Um, and in the Okavanga Delta, anyway, these two filmmakers were like, oh, there's this window when the water's cool where you could actually, we can go and dive into their underwater caves. If you can get off the surface quickly, which is where they kill you, uh, and get into their underwater caves, they're sluggish during this period. Anyway, I believed them, and I went with them, and I did like 20 dives with them to go into their underwater caves to get the best video. And it's, you should Google Anderson and Nile Crocodiles. It is the most ridiculous story I have ever done. Literally, I am face to face with a Nile Crocodile. Fast forward about six months later, after we finish this and after it airs, they call us up and they're like, remember that whole two week window thing we talked about? Like, we've learned that's actually not really a thing. So it actually wasn't true that they were like more sluggish, so yeah. But it's really, it's a great story. It's on, so you should check it out. So, people of longer tables, here we learned today that you can sit on a chair on the table and have the plate in front of you. Or sometimes you can decide to be on the plate. Here we met a man <laughs> that has been on, on both, both sides. sides of this question. Uh -huh. So this, this was longer tables. My friend Anderson, thank you for being here. My honor. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Peace out.